Okay, so we had a few technical difficulties, but I think we got most of them ironed out. But the format of, of the, today's show is we're going to start with this, the opening little spiel that I'll do, and then we're going to do an opening prayer. And then we have a uh, good friend Grant Reed here to uh, play the piano. He's going to play the national anthem for us. And then we're going to go through and allow all of our, our different panel guests to come up and um, uh, tell you about what they do or the experiences that they had when they were homeless vets themselves or they help homeless vets. And um, you're going to all have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you feel like you know you're, you don't have a voice or anything, we'll get you a mic to ask questions. But otherwise, just following their presentations, we're going to have an opportunity to ask questions. And then following the forum, you'll have an opportunity to speak with them individually. And I please, I, um, I encourage you to do so because they're all awesome people. They're all very charitable people, very compassionate people, and want to help homeless vets. And obviously, you guys do too, or you wouldn't be here. So let's go ahead and um, everybody stand up and take your hats off if you, if you don't mind. And then we're going to do um, an opening prayer. Dear God, I want to thank you for, for allowing us all to be here today, be able to, to share your love, God, and be able to, to help the vets that are out there in the world that need our help. Oh, so bad, bad Lord. We know, Lord, we took your calling. We heard that there, there are vets out there that, that hurt and need our help, and, and you're going to use us as, as your vessels to make, make sure that those vets don't hurt as much as they, they should. And today, Lord, on this day, Memorial Day, when we remember those, those people that, that, have, that have died in war, have died by, by their own hands or other people's hands, and we're gonna, we're gonna remember how much we love our brothers and our sisters. That, that we we love as much as the people that are in this room today, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to continue to have the blessings that you give us every day. In your son's name we pray, amen. All right, take it away, my friend.
pleasure to be here with you guys today on Memorial Day 2017. Obviously a special day for us in the military community where we remember those that we lost, uh, those that we served with, those that we continue to lose on a daily basis, 22 a day at a low ball estimate, uh, based off of the incomplete data provided by the VA. Uh, you mentioned hurt and your opening remarks and prayer. I'd like to touch on that a little bit if I can while you're here. Uh, and also, obviously, the medication piece of it, the services. So, hurt. We all have hurt. Veterans feel like uh, that, that's something that's universal. It's not unique to the veteran population. Uh, it's something that we can uh, hopefully empathize with uh, when we see uh, another human being going through some traumatic event in their lives. Uh, within the veteran community, obviously we have a unique bond in the sense that we're a melting pot in uh, our society, or a microcosm in our society. And the bonds that we uh, craft and develop during our time in service, oftentimes are, are lifelong uh, relationships that whether or not we're speaking to somebody on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, yearly basis, every 5, 10, 15 years at a reunion when they start because people start to notice that they're dying off now and how important it is to uh, get uh, a hold of one another, to do your buddy checks, hold each other accountable, make sure that we have a support network that is internal that we already paid in blood for most of the time to be a part of that fraternity. Um, and when you're dealing with something as uh, traumatic as combat, when you're trying to come home and transition into uh, civilized society again, or maybe your routine at the barracks now because you have to transition from your wartime gig to your peacetime gig, you're just not sure how to do that. Maybe you're starting to shut down your communication with your superiors, or with your peers, uh, or with those who you're leading, right? Uh, this all causes a lot of fear, a lot of frustration, uh, a lot of hurt, right? Because you can't communicate what you're going through. You can't let people know that you're feeling weak, that you're feeling afraid, that you're, you're feeling vulnerable, that you're, you're feeling like the bottom of the bucket is coming out and you have nowhere else to go because then you're seen as somebody that is a, uh, a hindrance to the mission of the unit, especially if you're in a combat arms unit, right? So the downsides of that occurs usually targets those who are acting out, usually targets those whose communication has broken down to such a level that they are now just seen as problem cases and they are usually identified and given bad paper and written up on charges sometimes and uh, those uh, instances more often than not lead to an honorable or other than honorable discharge, dishonorable discharge, stuff like that, where now you've gone from fostering this brotherhood, sisterhood, this community, this fraternity, this trust, this this bond, right? And you're coming back into a situation where they're telling you, no, 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 you got it wrong now uh, because you're broken. And this no longer applies to you. And so you have to go away from us because you're a distraction. And you're costly now to us. We don't want to fulfill our end of the bargain here on our contract. So what we're going to do is take the most expedient route to get you away from this organization that you uh, attempted to serve in the most honorable way that, that you can getting put out in the most dishonorable way that is out there. And with a dishonorable discharge, you're facing the modern day scarlet letter along with the felons who are on the street. Good luck getting a job at Burger King. You're 
access to your benefits are shut off now. You can't go to school. You, you can't go to the VA to receive the treatment that you need unless now I believe they're saying in DC you have a emergency need. No uh, treatment beforehand to make sure that it doesn't get to an emergency situation. You, know, you have no lifeline. But you're expected to suck it up. You're expected to come now. You've been in the military. You know what to do. You need to be successful. You need to be that role model. You need to be everything that we thought you were, right? What a load. What a, what a tremendous weight that you are now expected to bear with no resources available to you. The family that you have that is willing to support you will only be there for a certain amount of time before you start to weigh them down with the resources and the love and the attention that is required now to keep you going on a daily basis, sometimes from hour to hour, minute to minute. It's touch and go sometimes, for me, myself still. And I've been out of the active duty game since 2006. I went through three years of continuous treatment at the VA, inpatient programs, substance abuse treatment programs, uh, exposure therapy treatment programs, where I go in there and just talk about what it is that has uh, uh, happened to me and how I've experienced this and what it means for me now, living in this world where nobody seems to understand it. I was one of the fortunate ones because I started receiving these services when I was still in the active duty military because I was able to address a situation that was popping off red flags everywhere. And my loved ones started to look at me and say, what is wrong with you? What are you doing? Why are you acting this way? Why are you so angry? Why don't you get it that we're here for you and that we have resources and services for you? If you only ask, why are you taking it out on us when we're here to just care for you? We want to help you, but we don't understand how. And so that communication breakdown then happens on both levels now. And nobody's taking accountability from the military because now you're somebody else's problem. Maybe we gave you a cap. Maybe we told you how to out-process in a successful manner. But more often than not, if you're facing bad paper and bad discharge, you're not receiving any of those services. Maybe you're in the break. Maybe you're, you're, you're on convalescent leave like I was providing. You know, you just get away, go away, go home, figure it out, wait for your orders, come back and clear when you can. We'll do what we can to get you out of here post haste. Stay away. If you're lucky enough, like I was, to start to receive those services and resources where you can start to get those issues off your chest now, and you can start to discuss the ways that you feel let down by a system that you were willing to give your all to for ideals that now seem not to apply to you. Who went off and fought for them? I can't medicate myself with cannabis because it's federally illegal. But yet, I can get all the pills that I want from the VA, and I don't even have to leave my home to get them. They can send them to me to my mailbox. I can sign for them if that's even required anymore. And I can go back in my PJs with my hair all done, disheveled, and, and not leaving the home for a week, two weeks, a month, whatever the fuck. Excuse my language, I'm sorry, there's a child here. I get emotional, I get carried away. This is a raw nerve. But I can't have an open, honest, and free discussion with the people I'm being told are here to help me. Every time I go into the VA doctor, I have to re-explain why I'm here. I have to go over my paperwork again and let them know why I am here to see them. Because they don't care enough to look through my records to bring themselves up to speed, to address me in the appropriate manner, to, to maximize the time that we have together. Which, if you're going to the VA, they get you in 15 minutes late and try to get you out five minutes early. To go in there and spend 15, 20 minutes regurgitating old things with somebody that, you know, now is supposed to know you after a year, two years, three years, four years, gets old. And this is for somebody that's receiving those services. So when you're out on the streets, you have no lifeline, you have no ability to uh, latch 
latch on to anything, what is the most expected outcome? You're living on the street. You're doing everything that you can to maybe get a tent, man, like, and go and you're, that's luxury living. If you can find a tent, get a space where nobody's messing with you. Maybe find some place that is offering services or resources that provides you with maybe a fresh t-shirt. Maybe a haircut. These are the types of things that these veterans are, are uh, beyond emotional to receive. Thank you. Thank you so much for caring. Thank you so much for acknowledging. These people that we, we say are our heroes, these people that we say are the most uh, private citizens in our community, that we honor in such a way every year, and we tell them, we honor your service to our country. Thank you for serving us. Thank you for the freedoms that you provide for us. That's some selfish shit. That's some self-serving, that, that, it's nonsense. Because if we really cared, we'd be out there every weekend, we'd be out there every day, trying to make sure that these individuals who put their lives on the line, who went out there and sacrificed so much so that we could sit here in our fat asses and go to the mall, and we could sit here and, and talk about the, the latest outrage with the Starbucks and their stupid unicorn drink and all this other shit that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't care about your long line. I don't care about how long it took you to get to work. I don't care about how long it took you to get to soccer practice. I don't care. Because there's people out there that are dying on a daily basis who just want somebody to acknowledge their presence here. You're worried about a line? You're worried about being inconvenienced? Good. Maybe we should bump that up a little bit and make it so you're right, right uncomfortable. Because it seems to me that's the only thing that's gonna work. That's the only thing that's been proven to work. That's why the, the, the work that these gentlemen are doing has been so effective because they're not taking it anymore. They're saying this is what we require. How about that? These are necessities here that we are coming to collect on. Because we signed a contract, and we're not going to let you get out of it. How about that? That's where, that's where I'm at. I know that there's a lot of other individuals that are out there who are of my mind, who are no longer willing to accept the status quo, who are putting their foot down and saying, enough is enough. No, we're not going to let you treat us like that. We're not going to let you treat them like that. I don't care if we're over here living and able to go to the movies every night and go to the club and do this, all this nice things, these nice things that are, are nice, but this isn't what, is, what, what makes us great. These nice things aren't what fulfill us. It's making sure that each other, our brothers and sisters, are, are living in a manner that affords them respect, some dignity, and an opportunity to pursue the American dream. So, I don't really know if that's what you wanted, um, yeah, but hey, that's what I got. Let's get a round of applause for our presentation. I'll be here talking about the same for still this year. So, um, I don't think we need to run mics. I think the place is quite our quaint enough that we can um okay well if you i guess if you want to ask a question for the video people um i'll give him my mic and you can come up here and ask a question but there's a lot definitely i want i want to start with the first question actually and uh because you touched on the dishonorable discharges and like the situation that most people are with that and you're right i mean they people with dishonorable discharges is that's the scarlet letter for veterans much like um maybe being a child molester is a scarlet letter for the civilian population. What can somebody do? What, where are, what are the pathways, do you think, in your opinion? Um, so number one is you have to, in my opinion, the, the fact that even uh, dishonorable discharge is being equated with the child molester and stuff like that, that's the real that's beyond what I can stomach. Um, I, I think just calling it uh, 
of dishonorable discharge basically equates to a felony charge, regardless of what that charge is, or remorse, what have you. So um, we have to get closer to the root of the problem, in my opinion, and that goes into before these individuals are discharged and before they start the transition program to, to start addressing these very real issues that, uh, if we're being honest about the situation, they don't just magically occur as soon as somebody gets out of the military and, and or you know, has that incident which leads to their discharge. There are cues, there are signs, there are uh, missed opportunities to discuss the issue in depth or to offer some type of safe environment where it can be discussed, right? So trying to get as close to the root cause of it as you can would be my general kind of generic answer. It's, um, if you want, just go ahead and say the question for the video purposes. I'll repeat the question to them for you. Yeah, the question is, are there any, is there an appeal process to change that dishonorable or less than dishonorable? Okay, so the question was, is there an appeal process to change the less than honorable or dishonorable charge? Um, um, there is, uh, I'm sure. You know, you, have an appeals process through JAG, I believe. Um, but that, that again starts from hopefully before you get to that process where you're facing a discharge, you are uh, working with an intervention team or something like that, like in the civilian sector they call vet support, right? Um, so that you start to uh, work on those issues. And if there is an inevitable discharge that is to happen, you are making sure that it is uh, appropriate to the, the infraction, right? Or the, the whatever has happened to cause this uh, series of events to start to unfold. So uh, once you're already out though, uh, there's discussion right now, especially with the recent funding bill that, that just uh, is going up the, the pipe. On, on what to do with these individuals who are receiving these bad discharges because they're a significant percentage of the population. And, and when we're talking about healthcare, especially mental health care, why are we not starting with those who are exhibiting such extreme symptoms that they are now finding themselves on the way out of the military in such a uh, negative fashion? So. Um, I think we need to apply more pressure on our elected officials to address these types of issues and to hold them accountable um, for uh, the way that they treat our brothers and sisters, our, our sons and daughters, while they are in the care of the government. They can't just continue to take them, use them up, and spit them out, and say, now they're your problem. You know, there, there's something else that we need to be doing, and that's not, that's not any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, right. So you said you were active service and whatever, I think you free service. How is alternative medicine help your PTSD The question is how did alternative medicine help with this PTSD and the other uh, elements you may have occurred during your duty? I uh, sleep is the number one thing that I would acknowledge as being the, the most beneficial uh, result that I have experienced through my use of cannabis. Uh, sleep, is, it affects so much. You know, your attitude, your energy level, your focus and concentrate, uh, all these things could be directly attributed to sleep. Uh, while I was going through my medical board process, I, for the most part, refrain from the use of cannabis. I was taking the pills that were prescribed to me by the VA, uh, along with uh, some heavy drinking, a lot of drinking, which was a bad combination. Um, it ended in me going through substance abuse treatment programs, all that other jazz. 2010, I decided uh, it was done. And that was after weaning myself off from prescription narcotics after I got my discharge from the Army in 2009. And in 2010, from the beginning until now, I relied solely on cannabis for my symptom control, my anxiety, my anger, my depression.
Christ to sleep. There's a whole host of various symptoms that I, I use for those purposes, but uh, the most beneficial would be sleep. Okay, we'll ask, uh, take one last question if anybody wants. Okay, good. Well, there's one last hand for Ricardo. Okay, TC, if you want to make your way over to the video board. Actually, you're there. Okay, let's go ahead. Um, the next guy we're going to have up here, his name is Juan Carlos Montanesco. Um, probably one of one of the only people I know that is uh, a local celebrity of sorts. Um, this his his story, and I'll give a brief because I'm sure he's going to give a, a, a detailed explanation on it. Is um, he went around giving free haircuts uh, at Santa Rita Park, particularly, and uh, you know made it made it a bit of it and tried to invite other people to to be part of it. And uh, somebody complained about the about it, and they um, told the cosmetology board that he was doing it. And um, since he's a, as a cosmetology student, they fined him and said if he continued doing it, they wouldn't allow him to get his cosmetology license. So the news did a big story about it. We're about to watch that, and um, I'll actually let let the video explain the rest. The new school closed his doors, but that's not the only obstacle he ran into. The former students didn't stop from ever getting his professional license, all because he was giving free haircuts to the homeless. Bob Lowe and Kristen Howard talked to the man tonight and shared his story. Kristen. Teresa Juan Carlos has given out dozens of free haircuts to the homeless right here at the Santa Rita Park. Now he's devastated to learn that Arizona Board of Cosmetology has a complaint filed against him for giving those haircuts without a license. I was a kind of in heart. I was the memory of my mom because she loved her hair. Juan Carlos Montes de Oca thought he was doing a good deed for our community by offering free haircuts to the homeless, a service some of them hadn't received for a long time. About seven months was the longest one on the railway in about two years. Yeah, about a uh, basic trip. He too has been homeless in the past. That's why when his region in uni school closed its doors, he felt compelled to offer up his services for free. But now he found out the Arizona State Board of Cosmetology is investigating a complaint filed against him. I reached out to the board by phone tonight to get more answers. But even though he wasn't getting compensation from for the haircut, no, I then talked to their executive director who declined the comment on this because it's an active investigation. But she told me they stand by the words written in the state statute that say in part, a person shall not perform or attempt to perform cosmetology without a license or practice in any place other than in a license form. Juan Carlos said he wasn't aware of this regulation and is worried that the haircuts he offered for free could now cost him his future in cosmetology. They can suspend my even before I even try to get a license, they can say no. Uh, and that would be very, very unfortunate. The executive director told me they also have specific rules on health, safety, and sanitation. She told me working outside a licensed salon and using an unlicensed person is, quote, a real risk. We'll be sure to stay on top of this and let you know what happens. Reporting live on the south side, Kristen Hubbard, Fox 11 News. Kristen, thanks. And ladies and gentlemen, Juan Carlos Montanesco. Yeah. My name is Juan Carlos Montesioca. I am 26 years old and I am originally from Douglas, Arizona. I um, initially came to Tucson to study um, cosmetology um, about a year ago after my mom passed away. Um, my mom was a real uh, influence in my life um, and she, she got cancer and uh, she lost all her hair. So that's uh, why uh, I came to Tucson to you know better my life and um, get an opportunity to uh, help other people as well because my mom was really big about helping other people and um, 
So I signed up for a beauty school at Regency, um, did really well there, and uh, unfortunately they closed uh, from one day to the next. You know, we got a text message uh, saying that, you know, our school is going to be shut down and that we needed to get our stuff the next day. So I was really devastated about that. Um, and about a year ago, uh, I heard about Hope Fest, which uh, is about giving back to our community. Uh, initially, I wanted to become a public health nurse, um, but due to some choices that I made, wasn't able to. Um, and uh, so I started helping out uh, in the community. I started going to the parks as a student, still at the Regency, um, prior to their closing, and uh, did Hope Fest uh, 2016 and helped with haircuts there and I really liked what I did. I met a mom who had cancer. Um, one of my beauty school friends was just starting out and she had a friend who had who had just been diagnosed with it. Um, and so she wasn't emotionally ready to take a client that was suffering from cancer at the time because it was hard. It's a, it's a hard it's a hard topic. It's a hard subject. Um, and so um, you know I did her hair and stuff. I cut her I cut that woman's hair and uh, you know, it was amazing. And ever since then, I've just been, uh, you know, I've been going and going to Santa Rita Park, going to uh, Benito de Agosto. Um, it's crazy because I was telling John a while ago that Benito de Agosto in Spanish is my, uh, is my birthday in English. So August 20th, isn't that crazy? Um, I, uh, I got a call from the board after my uh, institute closed down. Um, from the investigator um, who told me that I was under investigation because of the fact that I was a student and apparently um, I didn't know um, that we're not allowed to help people for free. We're not allowed to do charity for free. We're not allowed to, um, you're not allowed to cut your child's hair without a license. Um, that's what, what, what that's what we found out, and um, so you know a lot of moms and a lot of parents were upset. A lot of families, the VOP family, you know John McLean, his family, our community got together and you know called the board, made phone calls, and um, governor found out about it. So they had called me um, and they told me, you know, I told her, I told her the truth. I said, uh, I, I helped organize an event. I've been doing this since October of 2016 out in my community. Um, and uh, I, I know that I don't have a license, but I'm going to school for it and I have a really big passion for it. And I also have a big passion for our veterans because my family is, you know, mainly consists of veterans. My two grandparents, my two grandfathers, they served in the Korean War, and um, six of my uncles, my grandma had 10 kids, so six of my uncles uh, were in the uh, Vietnam, and I always knew I was gonna you know, be a part of helping veterans. I just didn't know how, I didn't know if it was gonna be nursing, I didn't even know if it was gonna be, you know, I didn't know. To be honest with all of you, this wasn't, um, this wasn't my initial career choice. Um, initial career choice was to be a nurse, but God works in mysterious ways, and sometimes he works in really obvious ways, and it's hard to um, ignore it. When you know, I've been through a lot of, a lot, I've been through the worst, especially losing my mom, and a lot of my family members as well, um, to drugs and suicide as well. Um, I was really humbled when I found out that the uh, Arizona governor, uh, actually his office called me um, and made a lot of headlines. And uh, I was really happy, I cried a lot. I thought that um, I thought that I was never ever gonna be able to get my license, you know? Um, and for that whole week when I was under investigation, all I did was pray, to be honest. That's all I did. And I prayed and I prayed and I'm here standing now. Um, you know, I've been through the worst. I've, I've been in prison, I've been in jail. Um, and it feels really good to stand here today and share with you guys why exactly I do what I do. Because a lot of uh, veterans are being forgotten. A lot of people, a lot of our soldiers come home with 
not only injuries, but emotional problems. And a lot, and we see a lot of them on the streets. And a lot, and sometimes we don't know that they're even veterans because we turn, we turn around and we don't acknowledge it. But if we took five minutes out of our day to help somebody, whether if it's a haircut, if it's a dollar, a ride, bus fare, I've learned to to be more open and to love other people and to give back. And right now, currently, I um, I got a call about like in February, March from the governor's office telling me that um, it's okay to do what I do. And uh, the Institute for Justice as well, it has got my back. So I am still providing uh, haircuts for any veteran um, for free. Uh, I, I'm base barter at VOP and they have allowed me to, uh, they have allowed me to you know, do their hair and they're, they're my practice dummies and I'm getting better every day. You can ask T over there back there. I I never even uh, I never even had practiced on uh, ethnic hair before, but I got it right. So I'm doing something right. And I want to thank each and every one of you guys for supporting me and my mission and um, send send the veterans my way. I am actually working with the uh, Department of Economic Security and uh, o, uh, local other organizations to help my tuition. Um, which I'm really happy about. I got a letter this weekend, so it looks like my barber school will be fully paid for. I'm really happy about that. And the guys at VOP uh, set me up a barber spot, and I got the chairs, I have everything I need. And I'm really, really grateful that my community is here for me because I'm here for you guys 100%. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, that was pretty public. It was on Tucson News Now. They did a story about it. So um, yeah, it's, it's really good to see it. And I, I thank you personally for stay, s stepping up and putting your neck on the line where a lot of people may not have to uh, kind of iron out this issue because this is just one of many issues where you know, you're know you not allowed to give away free stuff and it doesn't make any sense. Today is Memorial Day and a lot of uh, a lot of companies like to give out ha free haircuts to veterans on Veterans Day and Memorial Day, but I do it every day. So I just want you guys to know that if there's ever a veteran that is in need or family members, come and see me at base. I love you guys. All right, love you guys. Thank you. Okay, so the next gentleman we have up here, um, another longtime friend, he and I um, collectively have lived on the streets. I think at least a decade, and um, we've stayed in similar places together, and uh, we used to both feed and help out at a church called Central City Assembly that did a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday feed. Uh, we did a men's shelter behind there with tiny houses, and he, I, and the pastor of that church and a couple other people went and lived on the street for three days and did a documentary about it to kind of show um, what it's really all about, and the... And the, the the moral of the story that the pastor came to was if he were to sleep anywhere, if he just, his wife kicked him out, he was going to be homeless um, today, he would go down to one of these locations, probably something just like Bravo Base or at the time it was Safe Park, where there is a community of people, there is a safe place because the other, other options are out in dark alleys and the losses and places like that where those are the places that people are being killed. So um, call my, my good friend Richard Krauser up, up to the stage. Everybody give him a hand. Oh yeah, he's a vet too. He's, he's an Air Force guy, so he didn't he didn't work as hard as this army guy, so we love him nonetheless. Army guys are useless. Yeah, what's what's the Air Force and Marines around me wouldn't know what to do. I um just like you know, I've known John for like four years now. I met him with Central City Assembly. Um 
I, yeah, you know, I was I had a total of five and a half years of being homeless. And um, when I first became homeless, there was no services. I didn't know anything about anything where you go get food, where to get services, anything like that. Um, you know, I've had family members in the Air Force, the Army, Navy, Marines, all that. And one of the ones in particular was my dad. When he was discharged from the Air Force, he went 19 years with no services before he even got his first benefit check. So he taught me a valuable lesson about, you know, you know li living a life of, of what you get. And um, one of the biggest problems that I see now is, you know, even though there's many services out there for the vets, there's no follow-up on the services. Um, you know, better to go to the hospital and ask for services, and he'll get it that day, but when he leaves, nobody follows up to find out if he's still getting those services anymore. And, I, you know, I've noticed that day in and day out, um, you know, up until I got connected with Kodak a little over a year ago, um, I didn't get any mental health services, I didn't get any services with that or anything like that. Uh, now I'm getting the services, I'm getting medication I need, hopefully I'll be getting housing at the, at the end of next week, and that leads to getting the surgeries done that I've been waiting for for 10 years that I've never gotten yet. Um, you know, when John and I and Pastor Dave went out and did that homeless thing, that was probably the proudest moment of my life right there, because um, it, it showed me that there are caring people out there um, yeah, you take a pastor of the church. Um, I personally, when he first said he was going to do it, and I, John asked me if I was going to go, I said yes. I thought, you know, he'll be out there one night, he'll be on the phone, he'll call his wife and say, come and get me, I can't do this anymore. But when he lasted those three days, we walked in that church on Sunday morning, and we, I mean, we basically reeked. We didn't smell so good, we didn't look so good. But the church accepted us, and everybody was so proud of what we accomplished that day. Um, well, yeah, I mean, what, what I like to see is a group of people get together, and every day, every day, these people are out there go out and finding these vets and getting them services they need. Um, it's like, you know, the, 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 the VA has been broken for a long time. I know John knows that. John's worked for the VA. You hear it on the news about veterans being thrown off and everything else. The thing is, is if we if we can just get these veterans out there, get them off the streets, get them the help they need, you know. I mean, um, you know, personally, five years ago, a friend of mine, um, we were sitting having a picnic at a park with a bunch of family members. He was a vet. He got no services. Right in the middle of it, he pulled out a gun and he blew his head off in front of his own family. I was devastated for that. And that, yeah, you know, to this day, I think, had the government stepped up and took care of these people who gave their lives, signed up to go out and fight for them, had he got the services then, would he be alive today? Yes, he would. Thank you. Give a round of applause for Richard. So I'll start off the questions on this one. Um, so as a as a homeless vet, what what can you say good about the services that are available? Like I know currently you have a housing voucher because you're a vet. What are the other services that you as a vet been able to utilize where your, your traditional civilian would have those same services available to them? Well, the, all, all, all the services I'm getting right now are outsourced. They're not through any. They're they're through Kodak. Um, they're the ones who are getting my medical, the ones who get my psychological things done, they're the ones who are taking care of my housing and everything else. Um, I know there are other services out there, and um, what I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know all the services. I need to get with John to learn about all these services and everything else. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what we're getting to, and, and I will. And I think that you've seen that's. You need to allow me to do that more. I'm sorry, I have to say that in front of everybody, but if you need a ride, if you need anything, if you need to go to my apartment complex, so we can get your apartment complex, call me. I'll get you. I know you've been going through something serious these past few weeks. Call me. Don't do that again, please. You're a good friend. Okay. So, um, any other questions for Richard? Yes, Jason. Um, the, um, when you went out with uh, Pastor John, did Pastor Dave think that how many of you went out with Pastor Dave as well? When you, uh, during your three days homeless with Pastor Dave, um, 
what what do you think was accomplished? What 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 did Pastor Dave come to some revelation? What new things did he learn? Well, one of the what one thing with Pastor Dave, uh, his goal was to learn what it was like to be a homeless person. Um, although he's he served for ten years or something. Like, no, I mean. Uh, Doing, doing Phoenix and everything else with homeless people. Yeah, it was like 10 years. But he never experienced the fact of being homeless. And when he got, his goal was to learn what it was like, to learn what services are available, and how far people had to walk to get these services. I guarantee you, we probably walked 100 miles or more in those three days. John just literally wore us out. But his goal, his goal was to learn what it was like and to bring awareness to the homeless people. And, and you know, the news media was all over it. Uh, and it's like every time we turn around, somebody was there interviewing John or Pastor Dave. So it did bring a lot of awareness to the homeless population. Okay, thank you. And another thing I wanted to point out actually is uh, one of the reasons I uh, wanted you as uh, a panel guest on the forum is for the our vets that are in here that um, are, are trying to get services, there's also these services avail available to the civilian population, which I mean, I. I commend Richard for his ability to maneuver the services um, in the civilian population to get you know, the disability that, had, that he um, had coming or the housing that he had coming. So um, my, my big thing I wanted for this, and much just like for, for Richard, is to give people the confidence to go get those services because we've all, we, we, we either don't have trust or we've heard the bad rumors or we believe them. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take people like myself and Richard and Lewis and day to day pulling people out of the freaking uh, desert to let them know that there is help available. So I, I thank you, Richard, for being on this panel and uh, thank you for, for helping people know the other part of this, this argument. Any other questions from our friend Richard? Well, let's give Richard a round of applause. <laughs> Supplies are donated by the public. 
we've got a lot of really good people out there that are helping us out and keeping us going. There are around 20 residents on base, mostly vets and a few civilians. Some move on and others take their place. You can't throw them away. I can't throw them away. Manny Jimenez is 66 years old and has been homeless for more than a year. Somebody needs to take a picture of that. Stuff. He's been here at Bravo for several months. Four years of the new resident coffee cup with a packed oil of The tanker with compound guns. The rain against the gas. Three more years of working the rain. The low emergency season. Drying up in Arizona. Three times a week. Manny travels to a VA hospital for treatment. My uh, liver and kidneys are not doing what they're supposed to do. And they hook up the dialysis to it and clean out the blood and return it to me. At least I got to pack this up. To live here, there are eight rules they must follow, including no drugs, no alcohol, and no smoking in tents. The third rule is residents need to help around the base on a daily basis. One way they are helping is by maintaining nearby property. Here they remove trash and debris from a trackside ravine. Well, I haven't found any buildings or anything yet, so that's a good thing. They work for state really. They all have various job tasks assigned to them. Through donations from the public, they have enough supplies to share with folks outside the camp. And they do every day. Well, snacks are in there with some peanut butter or something. That's the only good stuff like that. We love that stuff. Thank you. Hey, you're very welcome. We got to stay here out there. Anybody, anybody that needs food can come here and get it. Right now, we're preparing to run with 200 food boxes a week. That's not the third one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you for letting me know. What began with just a few tents more than a year ago has grown both in size and organization. Camp Bravo has become a refuge for many, but memories of life without shelter or protection are close. For me, it was daily uncertainty, not knowing where you're going to get your next meal, not knowing where you're going to spend the night the next night, where it's going to be safe, not knowing if somebody's going to come up and plug you in the head while you're sleeping and steal a little bit of the you have. I can't talk. I think the biggest challenge is the guy who yells get a job. You know, um, the people who just don't see you. So we'll bring up next to the stage the, uh, the man, the myth, the legend that is behind that base and um, a couple others prior to that one, or actually I believe one other prior to that one here in Tucson. Um, his name is Louis Arthur. He is the founder of Veterans on Patrol and Walking for the Forgotten Ministry. A hand round of applause for Louis Arthur. How's it going, everybody? Um, John, when John first approached me um, about the panel discussion that we were going to have again in the city, um, obviously, you know, and he knows that. When it comes to going out to talk to um, experts and panels and city officials and bureaucrats, I, I honestly believe in my heart, 99% of your time is wasted. Um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these meetings, we have people that are boxed with their own ideas. Um, you know, there's a platform that's presented uh, through nonprofit organizations. And uh, when we first started living with the homeless, well, first let me go back here to August uh, um, 21st. Next month uh, is 22 months when I left my home to live with the homeless in Phoenix. And I was looking for homeless veterans specifically because we had politicians going out on television, uh, Mayor Greg Stanton, John McCain, our First Lady Michelle Obama had come down. 
Um, they had this big media event where they stated that there were no more homeless veterans living in Phoenix. Now, I was living with them on a 22-day walkabout when all of this was being said on the media, and I was literally seeing so many people who could be helped, but there wasn't anyone around them to help them. Um, and living with them was the only way we were ever going to find out how to help them. Um, uh, my approach is unique. I operate the only SSO that's functioning in the nation. It's a self-sacrificing organization which means our Christian ministry does not take money. Um, you don't tie it to our church. There's no money exchange whatsoever. Removing the money, we removed all the government regulation. We operate under the Good Samaritan law. Uh, I violate camping ordinances and public land trespassing laws all the time. There is no law on the books that, that I believe um, should be followed if it prevents you from giving someone food, from giving someone medical care, from giving someone a safe place to sleep. Uh, I have a lot of radical ideas, and uh, they're radical because it's the exact opposite of what everyone else has been doing. Um, we can sit here and we can blame uh, law enforcement for targeting homeless. We can blame the VA for failing the homeless veterans. We can blame our social service providers out there for not getting out of their offices and actually onto the streets with their outreach teams to find these guys and take care of them. We can blame the city. We can blame our neighbor who's not paying attention. Or we can step up and say, we're gonna do the job ourselves. And there's enough people here, right here, just, just with this group right here. If everyone in this room went out and did one thing nice for someone else in our city, if everyone just in this room, one thing nice, you find a person who needs help, needs a prayer, needs a hug, they need food, standing on a corner, getting five bucks for something to eat, one thing nice, and it starts a ripple effect. It starts a ripple effect. Um, I don't really want to talk a whole lot about our program other than say if you want to see it in action, go out there. Uh, recently, um, we modified our program. I built it around our experiences on the ground. So we didn't make a program manual and go out there and execute the manual. We went out there and executed helping people and then we wrote our program manual and it's very flexible. Uh, right now, we run the only homeless veteran encampment that's actually ran by homeless veterans. Uh, there are no volunteers outside who's not homeless other than myself who has any veto power on that camp. The homeless are in charge of that camp. What you see in that video, you don't see myself, you don't see any of my volunteers. Every person you see featured in that video is a homeless individual. And I asked Tom when he came to do the story to specifically focus on their stories. We're always gonna be out here. We are always gonna be out here because there's always gonna be homeless individuals out here. But when we stop talking about homelessness as if it's a problem, because it's not, uh, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was homeless, and I don't think he was a problem. You're never going to eradicate it, so stop talking about all this money we're going to spend to end homelessness. It's not a problem. They're people. And I've, I've always believed in my heart, and this proves it, is that if we provide them a safe place with no agenda, and we provide them with the material support that they need, and we put them in charge of themselves, as crazy as it seems. Watch how many of them will pull their own homeless brothers and sisters out of that ditch and put them into a home. Now, Bravo's been operating under homeless command for two months, and their average right now is they are housing three individuals per week. We are housing veterans at a faster rate. We are partnered with the BA, Building 90, Andrew Young, Kessler's, they come out, Red Cross comes out, Project Action Veterans comes out, and the Prima Bear Foundation comes out. CBI is one of our biggest supporters. They come out continuously. So now you have a central hub, and this is a tent city. Okay, there are laws all across America right now where they're saying you can't just pitch a tent and make a camp in the city for homeless people. Um, and I don't believe that that's the solution, is to make a law to prevent us from doing something that obviously works. Uh, none of this is possible without people, without you. It's not me. It's not my volunteers that have been out here for almost two years. It, it's every single person who actually cared. 
I've met so many people where I look at their Facebook, for example, and you would see years of political posts. It's left versus right. It's blame Obama. It's blame Bush. It's la la la. I go to so many pages now, and I see families who stopped by and they saw that homeless veteran outside McDonald's, and they took him in and got something to eat, or they drove furniture over to a vet who just got his apartment. And you don't even have to be a vet. Because um, one of the biggest kickbacks we have against our program is we take civilians. But I've always believed you don't go into the homeless community and pick favorites. And a lot of our veterans, uh, their civilian friends out there have been living with them, have been sleeping with them, have struggled to find food with them, have been battling addictions with them. And I don't think separating them is the best way to handle that problem. So Bravo does help civilians. If a civilian comes to our camp and they want to work and work our program, they got to work twice as hard as the veterans, but you're in a pretty good encampment and you have a chance to get off of the streets. Um, I just want to touch one thing and I think it really hurts our homeless community. And that is the divide and the rift we have between our first responders, our fire department, our EMTs, and our Tucson Police Department officials. Um, as radical as some people say, and I understand a lot of people, there are bad cops out there. But there are also cops that pick up your homeless brothers and sisters, and instead of throwing them into your city jail, they're drunk, they're bringing them over to our camp. And we're putting them in our medical unit, and we're letting them sleep off their intoxication. And then when they wake up, we feed them, you need food, clothes, and even if they go back out and do the same thing, they're not going into jail. They're not getting sucked into the system. I've seen changes made within law enforcement community because they've been coming out to the camp, and they're meeting and talking to the homeless. And the reason why they're looking at it different is because they're seeing all these citizens that are standing up around us, and we're treating them as if they aren't second-class citizens. And it's an eye-opener. Whereas law enforcement sent out to ticket, fine, and harass, we've been requesting for quite some time right now for um, the community to step up and ask for the city, why don't we make a good Samaritan fund? Because I'm gonna tell you, I know over 40 officers right now in Tucson Police Department that if you would make a Good Samaritan Fund or 51% of their fines from revenue generation, tickets, uh, citations, if they would take 51% of that, put a Good Samaritan Fund for that officer, I know police officers who would go out there, pull over that guy with a broken taillight instead of writing him a ticket, drive him to AutoZone, give him the money he needs to fix that taillight. We don't give law enforcement an opportunity to come into our community because our city continues to use them as bullies. And until we step in and reach out, and they, they're coming in with clubs, I'm sorry, reach out with a hug sometimes and you'll change their mind. And if we get hit over the head, we're a strong enough community. Veterans don't show, I tell everyone, we don't tolerate any law enforcement officer if they're gonna go out and target um, the homeless, it's BS. We faced the arrest several times because they were going to bulldoze a camp and we stood there in front of them and said, you have to arrest us first. And that's not me saying that. There's news media stories of several police standoffs. We're fighting against each other. And we're talking about a problem, which isn't a problem. Because homeless people are not a problem, they're people. When we get that disconnect and we remove it and we start reaching across the aisle, and you'll see Tucson Fire Department just came out. They're doing their blanket drive again. You guys know last winter they came out and we had thousands of blankets and the law enforcement in this city and the first responders, firefighters, EMTs came out to our camp for an entire week. We're loading their trucks up with all those FEMA blankets that got distributed last winter, okay? They didn't get any media recognition. Okay, there's no one out there saying, hey, look, there's actually police officers and firefighters who care about the homeless because it's not a good news story. What we want to do is to give them more opportunities to come and help us. And then we want the homeless community to reach out with law enforcement. There are, there are bad neighborhoods where we have women being raped. If, law, if the homeless could trust law enforcement, um, you would have a lot less rapes with the homeless women out there because they'd be able to go and talk to the law enforcement officer and not fear some type of repercussion. Um, there's certain areas where we're killing ourselves. And if we could just fill those gaps, think outside the box, we can change a lot of lives. We're not gonna save everyone. We're not meant to save everyone. But one person at a time, that's, that's what I honestly believe. And I thank every single one, my God first and foremost for myself, um, 
and, and everyone who served here that are veterans in this building today. Um, I don't celebrate Memorial Day. I have a lot of gold star moms. Every family you see represented on these 22 ribbons are veterans we've lost to suicide on this side of the soil. And this isn't a day of celebration for them. Um, for me, it's another day of service. We have our teams right now monitoring Facebook. If we have any veteran in Tucson who's hitting a rabbit hole tonight, it's a hard day for them. We're ready. We'll go out. We'll find them. We'll extract them. We'll get them to our camp. We'll take care of them. Um, and it's everyday service. And that's what we're going to need. Um, that's what we're going to eventually need is more people that are going to step up and say, I'm going to do this every day. And fortunately for us, we've uh, got a 70% homeless veteran volunteer in our organization, which means seven out of 10 of my volunteers are homeless, still homeless. So a lot of the people we've housed still come back and volunteer, but I'm talking homeless volunteers for our account, seven out of 10. And our goal is to continue to give them the tools, the skills, the supplies, whatever they need to lead themselves because they know how to take care of better care of themselves, as most of you know, than any of us. I've been living with them for almost two years. I still ain't figured them out. I love them to death, but there's just so many different areas in this community that you're never going to figure it out, but you guys can. And you guys can take care of each other. And our goal is to keep finding places. We're looking to establish more camps in the city so we can provide. I've got a platform for the mentally ill. We've got a platform for the domestic violence, the women who are being raped and beaten. And, you know, there's lies. Some of you know, there's a lot of bad stuff to go on in these streets at nighttime. We got a lot of great ideas, but it takes people to put those ideas into practice. So the minute we start, uh, stop. The minute we stop talking about the politicians who are failing us, the law enforcement who are bullying us, the, the VA who's not treating us right, it doesn't matter. The minute we stop complaining and pointing our fingers at them and start doing and solving the problem ourselves, they're obsolete. They're impotent. The city of Tucson hasn't really been able to move in and hurt Bravo Camp for almost two years. You know, we've had a tent city there. There's no permits there. Yeah. And you have over 300 individuals just in Tucson alone who's transitioned through our camp. They're not always great stories, but understand, we go out and we look for the worst of the worst. I look for chronic homeless veterans who are almost 10 or more years. I look for the ones with the heaviest addiction problems, be they meth, crack, heroin. I look for the ones that no one else is going to look for. That's what I go out and look for. I look for the hardest people, the ones that have nobody. Because I've been there before. I've been on that street. I've been one of those hard people. And so many people reached out to me and I never grabbed that lifeline. They weren't reaching out to me in a way that could relate to me. I've been able to learn in all the areas of how people couldn't relate to me to find ways that I can relate to those who have no one out there. And there are a bunch of them out there in our city right now. We have veterans that we don't know about still sleeping on our streets. And when we move past the discussions and asking the city to help us and just go out and take care of them ourselves, that's effective change. And that means something. And no one can take away that blessing from you. When you give to someone else with no agenda in your heart other than to give and to help, there isn't a pill you can make, there isn't a law you can write, there isn't a program you can fund that is going to achieve what your genuine compassion for that individual will achieve. And if you have any questions about uh, what we do, I'll turn the floor over to you right now. So. I think round of applause for this one. Okay, so any questions? Yes, right. So what about the general homeless people who come here camp after help? Are they treated with the same respect as the veterans? When you have a homeless community encampment, you're going to have um, every personality you can imagine. At Bravo Base right now, I have military sexual trauma, I have traumatic brain injury, I have post-traumatic stress disorder, I have civilians with mental illness, I have unmedicated individuals who aren't taking their medication. Um, unfortunately, no one's always going to be treated or happy uh, with the treatment they receive when they go to any shelter or any encampment. I'll never be able to change that. 
but one thing that we always do and we've done, uh, we tattoo Rob, as most of you know, Robert Anderson, he just fell off again, but everyone gave up on him. And how many times when he was in his drug addiction would he come to our camps and rob and steal? What did we do? When he was ready for help, we helped him. So if the individual comes in and they have a problem and they're not ready to receive help, there's not much we can do. If they come in and they want to receive help and they want to help themselves, there's nothing we won't do to try to help them. Okay, as a side note, I'm going to ask a question. Um, so when a vet comes there uh, initially, like what's the, I know it's situation to situation, but what have you seen like um, on a regular is the best service to, to offer him? And what, like you know, if I tell him, okay, this service is available, it's going to be available every time. Um, well, when the veterans come, uh, they're more apt to receive help from the service providers uh, when there's no strings attached. So one of the services we provide is, our, we're the only shelter, first off, I, the only shelter that I know of, if you have a medical card, you can smoke on the property. I have veterans, I know it's no drug and alcohol, but I have home veterans who go through a harm reduction model, and they're allowed to drink in their tents. I try to design the lowest demand shelter for the ones who are on the streets at night because other shelters have rules and regulations that just some people aren't willing to accept. And um, one thing you'll have at uh, uh, Bravo is freedom. You don't have a breathalyzer being stuffed in your face when you come on base. You don't have a check-in, check-out time. You don't have to show me your ID to get in and out the door. If you're a veteran, you have to show credentials now. Um, but we still help civilians. Uh, it's just freedom, man. It's, it's no government regulation. When I go and I live with some of these guys out in the deserts and I tell them how great my camp is, you know, I'm not lying. I've got a beautiful camp. When I tell them I don't work for the government, I tell them I don't take money and I don't get paid, I can take away every excuse they've been using for so many years not to get help. And once we get them into the camp, we get them accustomed to a porta john, to fresh food every day, food, clothing, medical care is provided. We've, we've got two top neurologists that provide medical care for free at our camp. We've got a, a world renowned acupuncturist. I love Nancy. She's with Acupuncturist Without Borders. We provide medical services for free at our camp. These are all things that a veteran can benefit from going in there. But we're always going to have people who don't like our program. We're always going to have people who didn't get along with other people. We're going after the worst of the worst as the city sees it. These are the individuals who refuse services. They're nothing but junkies, drug addicts, and criminals. That's the way the city views these individuals. I see, I see people who can do amazing things because if God can take me from what I used to be and do all this stuff through our work, he can do amazing things with every junkie, criminal, nobody that's on the streets right now, according to what the city views him as. And I, I really believe that. I see it every day. Okay. No other questions? A round of applause for... Oh, actually, go ahead. Yes. I know that you want to do the best. Um, our ministry was started four and a half years ago. I was doing Greek counseling for the moms of the 22. Um, these are gold star moms. Uh, these are these are men and women who fought for our country and they came home and they lost their battle, whether it was the untreated traumatic brain injury, over medication from the VA. It was just somewhere along the line they lost their battle and we failed them. Um, the, these families right here are always, always number one in my heart. Um, today's a hard day for them. Uh, Bravo Base is named after Camp Conklin, or it's named Camp Conklin. It's named after Brandon Conklin. Mother is Kyle Barty. She's in North Carolina. She gets up on Facebook every morning to go to that page who's named after her son, whose ribbon's flying on this right here. And she sees people bringing food and water and clothes to homeless veterans. She sees the civilians and the homeless veterans going out in the community and, and picking up trash and intervening in fights and, and trying just to keep peace so no one's getting arrested and going to jail. She sees so many good things. But when she wakes up, she sees her son's name, Conklin. When she goes to that page, Conklin. And it's giving her, our moms, for me, it's giving them something. So when they wake up, they're, they're suffering in silence. You want to talk about the veteran suicide epidemic, we can have a two-hour forum on it because there isn't much. I've been fighting it, she'll tell you, for almost five years. All right? We're losing them. 
22 a day, I don't care if it's one a day, but it's more than 22 a day. And the reason why we're losing them is because we're too busy arguing about what the next politician is going to do. We're too busy arguing about Muslim versus Christian versus atheist versus Jew or straight versus gay versus transgender versus bisexual, black, white, brown, red. We're too busy arguing and fighting with each other. When I see these soldiers come back and they're not like us. They're not like any of us. If you haven't served, they know that community. Because when you go in a veteran community, it don't matter who you worship. It don't matter what you look like. It don't matter who you voted for. Because that community is going to stand up and take care of each other. And the problem is we the people aren't giving them the tools they need. And we're not putting them in charge of their own hospitals. We're not putting them in charge of their own care. These families, to me, this is what today is about. Because these are 22 names of people who should be standing right here with us helping pull homeless veterans off the streets, but they can't. And we're going to make sure they're not forgotten, and our goal is to keep building camps and keep naming them after them. Why is it, why is today Memorial Day an appropriate setting for this particular kind of conversation in your well, this isn't a celebration here. We're not sitting here celebrating. Um, and I think this is a good forum to have somewhere right here in the city of Tucson. And we are there. There are people that have come together around the cause of uh, veteran issues and homelessness and poverty in general, which, you know, taking care of Americans, taking care of our neighbors. Uh, we send them off to fight. And when they come back, they're not taken care of. I think this is highly appropriate for today because right now we have people on watch, monitoring Facebook, looking for veterans having a hard time. We have vehicles out here. You let a phone call come in, you'll see six, seven guys run out there to go save someone. Because we are here acknowledging that there are gaping holes in veteran services and there are gaping holes in our community. And I'm hoping that people take what they learn from here today and see ideas and start talking to your neighbor. Start talking. Don't say thank you for your service. Do something. That's the only way you're going to probably thank you. Serving them every day is the best I can do. But I'm glad to. And, and I love it. And, and I'm telling you, I love I love them. They're, they're some amazing people. You're homeless veterans. If you guys, some of you don't know, but some of the most amazing people. I've learned so much from them. You know, they're leaders. And they're survivors. And they have a lot of talent and skills that you could be using in your community to make your community a better place. And once you reach out and, and grab their hand and drag them in, you're going to start seeing a lot of positive changes. I see it all the time. We put them in charge of that camp. The homeless are running that property. And tell me that doesn't make the city skin crawl, realizing the homeless are running that property. And they're doing a damn good job. We're going to keep helping them and give them everything they need. Anything else? All right. Big round of applause for Lewis Hurley. Okay, so actually, I, we had one other person that's supposed to be here. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know Cliff Wade, uh, his wife Beverly Wade, the uh, my apartment manager actually was supposed to be here because she helps a lot of vets. She wasn't able to make it, but I'm going to be your last. Yes, sir. I'm going to be the last panel guest, so let's go ahead and queue up the video and um, this me. As a Tucson man has dedicated himself to finding a safe place to sleep for Tucson's homeless. And John McLean found a safe park just last year. It's at Nieta de Agosto Park in downtown and has acted as a legal safe haven for homeless, free from fear or harassment. But McLean is looking for even more permanent solutions that could take these homeless off the streets for good. Now you've had some more notario as the story. Park downtown, Tucson's homeless congregate throughout the day. A safe place to be, sleep, and eat. Generous people like Vanessa Carbia come at different times of day and night, bringing food and drink and friendship. I have hope because maybe um, I never imagined to be in that situation. But you never know. John Frederick found himself out on the streets six months ago after he lost his job, then his home. I've always had a place to live, I've always had a job. And I came close to becoming homeless, I always find a way out. But this time it didn't work. And when it didn't work, he didn't know where to turn. I wasn't sure where to go. I've never been homeless here in Tucson, so we all went out to the desert on the 22nd in person. Until another homeless man told him about Safe Park. We got all these people here that look out for each other. We feel safe. No 
knowing where homeless are allowed to sleep is the first battle. John McLean faced it firsthand during protests for Occupy Tucson. The same laws that they use against us to get us out of the park are the same laws that they use against homeless people every single day. So having seen it, it was either turn a blind eye, eye to it and go back to life with them before, or actually address the problem so other people in the future won't have to address it. I didn't know it was like, so I have some tunnels. It's kind of nice to know that a person like John McLean, who is the John McLean of the other partners, have set up a place where people who are homeless can come to sleep 24 hours a day, as long as they're on this side of the line. You see this line right here, it signifies where the park ends and the sidewalk begins. Homeless are not allowed to sleep in the park at night, so they have to stay on this side of the line while also allowing five feet between them and the curb to avoid obstructing the sidewalk. But a more permanent solution could get homeless off the sidewalk for good. Central City Assembly Church near 22nd and I-10 worked with McLean to build a Dream Center. With tiny homes and cubbies, the Dream Center provides a safe place off the streets to sleep along with bathrooms and food. Jason Cochran himself was houseless before calling the Dream Center home. I had nowhere to go, so I came out here and I didn't know anything. And John McLean pulled me aside and, um, it, I'm sorry, it's really emotional. He, um, he gave me a blanket, he gave me a place to sleep, he gave me food, um, he gave me hope. He calls it a game changer and has joined the claim in the cause. We want to get a bigger dream center where we can have more people um, in more places. And once they're there, we'll be able to work and, and achieve more. Until then, he says he'll hang the American flag upside down. It's the official signal of Americans in distress. And Cochran says that's what he sees on Tucson streets. Simone Del Rosario, Kega 9 on your side. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for seeing that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about um, that part, obviously. I, actually, one thing I will say, the one guy in the video, the, the, old, um, the, the older, um, bigger gentleman, he was a vet. He was actually a Navy vet. And I think much like, um, I think the reason I want you guys to see that, much like with Bravo Base, um, there's, there aren't too many options for uh, the homeless and the homeless veteran population. Um, even even if if we every every homeless person decided to stay in a shelter, there's only so much capacity. Even at Bravo Base, they only have so much capacity. So these these other alternatives we have to have. Um, so I did this for six years. I, I was homeless and I was a homeless advocate. I've done forums like these. Um, but I'm a veteran, you know, I'm an Army veteran. And for the whole time I did that, and probably and my father is still here, he did he attest that nobody knew I was a veteran. Because for some reason I was ashamed of it. Obviously I had my own reasons, whether it was, uh, I felt like I was duped to join the military or because of the stuff that I experienced in combat at the time I was in Iraq, or just coming back and being frustrated by the VA system, or, you know, the number of things that you've heard up here. And, but, um, so I lived on the streets for five years because I, I refused to, the only thing I'd go to the VA for, and I, I still say a lot of good things about it today is to get showers, to get haircuts, and clothes. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they're building 90 homeless area. You can get showers, haircuts, and clothes, and that's really cool. But for years, all that's, that's all I did. I didn't get housing, didn't want housing, didn't want any services, and I, I refused to do that. But finally, once I did it, and if I would have gone through the process I finally went through uh, four, four and a half, five years sooner, I wouldn't have been probably homeless at all, if not only homeless for a very short amount of time because, and I'll tell you my story, I went to um, Primavera, which is right across the street from the VA, and they have, um, they have a group called Project Action for Veterans out of there, and they got me a housing voucher, and what that housing voucher does is it pays for your, your house and your utilities for up to three months. And then from there, they pretty much walked me across the street to the VA, and they got me a Section 8 voucher, which is an indefinite voucher until your, pretty much your income surpasses $2,500 a month. Um, so it was, it was definitely, it was a step in my life. After not having a place for five years, I finally had some, some place to call home. And the VA helped me with getting a bed, getting furniture. So these services are available. And then from there, um, I went over to the Dis Disabled American Vets and they helped me file my paperwork for disability. 
and, and it's, it was a, a very timely process. They denied me twice. They finally accepted me the third time. I didn't get the rating I want, but I did get it. And and this is the process, and these are the services that are available to vets. And, and I, I mean, granted, uh, luckily I don't have a dishonorable discharge. I am a combat vet. I do have over two years of active duty. And these are the little uh, catches that get people sometimes. But uh, there, there are ways to maneuver around it. And um, moving forward, I, I wanted a lot of these people that I have here, this is the future. And I don't know if, like, if, how many homeless veteran advocates you guys know, I'm, I'm sure Jenny you know a lot because you're a social service worker yourself, but most of them really aren't in the streets and they're really not at the forefront. They're not willing to put their neck out and say some of the stuff that Ricardo said today or that Richard said or that Lewis said. I mean, the, the honest, honest stuff and, and do the hard work. Like, particularly, who do you know out there, I mean, short of the handful of people at 420 Social Club with Dave Croto that are advocating for veterans to smoke marijuana that are out there saying it publicly. I mean, it's just not happening. So I thank you for doing that. So um, unless you guys have any questions, I really didn't want to say much because this wasn't about me. This is about these guys. It's about the services. Uh, one thing I will say, you have these little little postcards on your desk there. The reason, main reason why I did these events because these people on the back, they... they sponsored this event so I could make thousands of these. And these thousands of things, I've made sure they got into vets' hands because this list of five things on the bottom, these are the services that I got that made it so I wasn't homeless anymore. So if you don't have one, please take one and give it to a vet, uh, whether they're homeless or not, because they, they probably don't even believe these services exist, but they're right here on this paper. So do we have any questions before we leave? No, well, thank you guys all for being here. I, I, actually, we got, oh, I got one, yes. Yeah, uh, my question is, the veterans, as one of the veterans, our brothers and sisters are powerless because they're in the law. Is there the idea or is there the hope that there be homeless building among others? Invisible people, like right? you know, such as indigenous people. We've been invisible for five hundred years. So until those of us who are invisible and powerless, until they see our collective face and feel our collective power, we will be able to have these forms of powerlessness. So how do we how do we give ourselves power? Well, I, I achieve power. I, I think that those blueprints have exist not only throughout modern American history, but they, you've seen them here at this forum. And I mean, I'm sure you've seen them even in your own own communities where we stopped, like Lewis was saying, we stopped just sitting around and waiting for the government to step up or waiting for this person to step up or waiting for this person to start doing it, and we just start doing it. And I, I want to think that, and there's a, a lot of things I try to highlight here, these alternative models that exist, exist. there's a, encampments that people are happy to live at. There's tiny house villages that people are happy to live at. If you gave, you know, if you allowed for a, a piece of desert land for people to just set up tents, people would be happy to live, in, to live at. So it's just going to be a matter of us as community, as members, citizens of this country, to step up and do these things that we think that need to be done and be willing to put our necks on the line, um, regardless of the consequences, within reason. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you.